But at least, at least with a flat interface, one of the things you cannot fault it for is adding unnecessary stupid visual noise. On today's episode of Roland Rambles, I tell you all about what I think about Windows 2000 and touchscreens. We're going to talk about Windows 2000 first and why I think Windows 2000 is the best Windows ever made. Some of you see this as a bit of sacrilege. Some of you think that Windows XP was the best Windows ever. I beg to differ. <coughs> Excuse me. Because Windows XP marks a departure from what Windows 2000 is. Now granted, Windows XP is great. If you tweak it up, Windows XP runs pretty darn well. And on newer hardware, if you can somehow find drivers, which is hard to do for a lot of newer hardware, but if you can somehow get drivers that work, even a 10-year-old computer with an SSD, assuming that you align the partition to Sector 64 instead of 63, which is the default on most machines, um, if you do the SSD page alignment thing with the partitions, Windows XP runs great on a newer machine to the point that it's embarrassing to run something newer. But here's the deal. Windows 2000 marked a departure for me from Windows 95 and 98. <clears throat> now, I need to probably go over the history of this, and, and when I, you know, the decade that I get the the whole user interface documentary done, I will probably be able to show this stuff to you in more detail, but the history goes, you had DOS, MS-DOS from Microsoft, then you had Windows, and you got up to about Windows 3.1, which is where most people moved over from DOS to mainstream Windows, and Windows 3.1 it was, I mean, it was big. It was a big deal, even Windows 3.0, but 3.1 is what most people who got started in Windows earlier really use seriously because before Windows 3.1, you didn't have that big of a software base for Windows in the first place. Windows 1.0 was practically just a DOS shell. It barely did anything. It was, it, technically, they, they, they ran a program called MS-DOS Executive which was pretty much just file manager from like a proto file manager from Windows 3.1. If you run DOS shell on MS DOS 6, it, it's basically it's basically the same thing as Windows 1.0 for uh, most purposes. So it wasn't until Windows 3.1 that people really started to use Windows in large numbers. Now here's the problem with 3.1. Well, there's a few. First of all. It's fairly obvious that there's a DOS heritage here. Um, 3.1 marked the real transition into 386 and higher machines. Um, it, it, was a, it was the beginning of a pretty fundamental shift where protected mode programming, 32-bit protected mode programming was, became the norm. And, and Windows 3.1, um, they had real mode and protected mode, which are both 16-bit. But protected mode um, would run the, like the core in 32-bit, but everything around it's still a bunch of 16-bit software. Um, but it still ran in 32-bit protected mode, which gave it access to more memory for applications and such. It didn't run the Win32 API, but it used the features of protected mode to access more memory, and there were some programs that could take advantage of that. I actually just realized that I don't fully understand how Windows 3.1 used protected mode. Um, I'm getting a little bit into the weeds on that. The bottom line is that 3.1 basically was the version that let you take a 386 or higher and really use a lot of the potential that that processor series brought to the mainstream. 386 and 486 chips were what most people had in computers in the early 90s when Windows 3.1 was a thing. Um, but Windows 3.1 draws from a DOS heritage, which means that there's a lot of stuff in 3.1 that exists um, exclusively because DOS was such a big thing and so many programs ran on DOS. And the biggest enemy of any operating system or just general 
environment, if you will, any sort of programming environment, the biggest enemy is a lack of applications. For example, the biggest enemy of me switching to Linux is Adobe Premiere Pro. And yeah, I've got some alternatives, but I haven't really had enough time to test those uh, and learn them. And there are a lot of shitty video editors for Linux. Boy, oh boy, are there a lot of shitty video editors for Linux. I, uh, I'm not sure how people get anything done. So, so the DOS heritage of Windows 3.1 meant that it had to be compatible with DOS because if you don't have applications that people want or need to use, then they're not going to use your system. They're just not. That's just the most beautiful, elegant, best, cre you know, just, just superior in every way imaginable operating system in the world will never ever succeed if it doesn't have a word processor, for example. That's pretty much impossible to avoid. You, you've got to at least have that. And these days, you've got to at least have a web browser. But back in the Windows 3.1 days, office applications like a word processor, calculator, <coughs> spreadsheet, that kind of stuff was where it's at. Maybe some graphical um, editing programs. But so DOS had to kind of, it kind of dragged Windows 3.1 down a bit. It had no choice to, but to just stick with the whole DOS thing. It had to be compatible. You had to be able to run virtual 8086 mode. Um, command prompts or DOS prompts and run DOS programs and have them work at a high 90-something percent compatibility level. You know, they had to work. If the DOS programs didn't work, why would you use Windows? Because now you have to have Windows programs or, it, or you're just screwed. You can't use your existing investment in DOS programs. So 3.1, you know, and plus because it targeted 286s as well, and, and people were still running original 8086 machines, like 80s 16-bit only machines were still a big thing, real mode had to be supported. You didn't, you couldn't let go of those old machines. <coughs> God damn it, what the fuck? So because you had no choice but to keep those machines around. You had to support ancient machines. Th this is like when people complain about backwards compatibility to today, I just want to slap them upside the fucking head and be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You have no idea what you're talking about. You don't understand what backwards compatibility even is. All you think is it means that some ugly widgets exist in Windows or that scaling doesn't work. But backwards compatibility is so much more than that. And the problems of backwards compatibility today have to largely to do with like high DPI screens and not having vectorized icons or whatever, you know, for ridiculous screens. Like what in the fuck are they doing putting 4K screens in a 13 inch laptop? That's just stupid. I, I don't care if you think it looks pretty. It doesn't, you can't really tell that much of a difference. I mean, 1080p is already too much, but then they're seriously putting 4K screens in 13-inch laptops. You can't even see the difference, not even a little bit. And and we're supposed to make all software cater to that crap. You know what? I don't feel bad for you. I don't feel bad for people who use extreme high DPI screens. Fuck you. Fuck you and your high DPI screen. I don't care. You're bringing the rest of us down because all you're going to do is whine about backward compatibility because you bought a stupid screen that you can't even see the pixel difference on. But, oh, hey, the number's bigger, so it must be better. But enough about that. People today don't understand backwards compatibility. They don't understand how trivial they're stupid. Like, oh, icons aren't supported. Like, like these icons are, t are not, you know, they're not compatible with the with the big screens that are out there. They, they just don't get it. They think it means ugly icons, and it doesn't. Because back in the day, Windows 3.1 had to support real mode. Windows could not stop supporting 16-bit stuff. Even 32-bit protected mode Windows had no choice but to run DOS machines, virtual DOS machines, inside of Windows. And there is literally a mode on 386 and up uh, CPUs called Virtual 8086 mode that it was used to support effectively the prototype version of containers or virtualization almost. I mean, it ran on native hardware, but it did so in a contained fashion. Um, on, I mean, on Windows, you'd have these, it, it would basically, to do DOS properly, it would simulate 
an entire 8086, um, you know, 16-bit, one megabyte address space um, segmented machine, like its own separate machine. And it would virtualize certain calls and and buy and uh, like certain interrupt calls, like hard drive accesses, and pass them through its own drivers. <clears throat> but the point is that it basically created a virtual machine for every DOS box that opened, and it it had to be able to run 16-bit programs through and through. There was no way to avoid it. It was in its DNA. Windows three, Windows for Workgroups 3.11 was the first Windows 3 departure from 16-bit support. Windows for Workgroups 3.11 did not support real mode. You could only run it in protected mode. Other than that, it didn't have much to offer besides built-in networking that included support for Microsoft Windows networking, you know, Net, Net BEUI, that kind of stuff. So, Windows for Workgroups 3.11 was basically the first like network capable consumer-ish version of Windows. And it also dropped a lot of the 16-bit compatibility. Network drivers had to be, you know, 32-bit clean and all that. Well, when you move to Windows 95, there were a lot of changes under the hood, but fundamentally 95 and then 98 and even Millennium Edition, they still had to support all 16-bit software including first-class support for MS-DOS Virtual 8086 boxes on Windows 95, 98, Millennium. And we're talking, like, 95 tried to keep you from using the DOS side of it, but it was still based on DOS. 98 and Millennium Edition, still based on DOS. Now, they technically were evolutions of MS-DOS at the core, but what happened is over time, they made it so that more and more of the Windows system could override the DOS system such that the DOS system would allow itself to basically be replaced by the 32-bit operating system on top. But like I said, there's still all the 16-bit crap everywhere. And the reason that Windows Millennium Edition and older were so crashy, they would blue screen, they just all kinds of weird stuff would happen, you'd have all kinds of glitchy problems just stability back then was a very relative term for, for the Microsoft Windows and DOS and all that. Just good luck, bro. Good luck with your stability. Windows 2000 changed all that. Now, Windows 2000 was not the first Windows operating system that brought a 32-bit clean from the ground up protected mode operating system implementation to the world of Windows. But it was the first one that wasn't a piece of shit. Anybody who's used Windows NT 3.1, 3.5, 3.51, 4.0 knows that Windows NT, okay, it's generally a lot more stable because it's a clean implementation from the ground up, whole new core paradigms that had compatibility layers to bring in some compatibility with existing programs. But it was 32-bit clean. It was protected mode only. Everything ground up just all of it clean <clears throat> so a lot of the problems that came with this stacking of ridiculous compatibility bs to be able to run dos programs from the early 80s on a modern windows 98 machine you know all that was gone they still supported dos boxes they had command prompts consoles but they didn't run the same way they didn't run the first class virtual 8086 they ran you know, they were 32-bit protected mode, and they still provided a Windows-on-Windows 16-bit Windows environment, but the compatibility was not there the way it was in Windows 95 and 98. But at the same time, Windows NT had its own serious quirks. <coughs> um, it was kind of... It was stable when it worked, but it was notorious that if an administrator touched it, it would be a friggin' nightmare. Windows NT was like an angry toddler on crack if you tried to administer it. But, I mean, when you got things solid, it was a stable, fundamentally, at the core, a very stable system. Because it discarded a lot of things that allowed instability to be introduced in the name of compatibility. It was not capable of running on 16-bit machines. 16-bit code was second class. 
they could run it, but it was not first class. It was not the, the main thing to support. So if the question was, do we allow full compatibility or do we sacrifice a little bit of compatibility in the name of higher stability, they erred on the side of stability. Windows 2000 is where you take Windows NT, the core fundamental, like kernel level stability of it. You put the window, you take the Windows 95 interface that they added in NT 4.0, you just bring that along but then you work out all the kinks, and that's the thing. Windows 2000, not, did I say NT4? Windows 2000 was Windows NT4 with a lot of the bad decisions fixed. It, it sort of was like the Windows 7 to Windows Vista. And it was what Windows NT4 would have been had they spent a lot more time working on it. Basically, Windows 2000 made the, it took the Windows 95 interface that worked so well, um, it added on some features that are important like high color icon support and all that stuff, but um, it, it gave you the, the stability of Windows NT at the core with, basically it brought in a lot of the compatibility with the older stuff without sacrificing the stability. It was more stable, it, it updated better, just all around, Windows 2000 was what every Windows operating system previous to it aspired to be. And I think it's telling that Windows 2000 came out in 1999, and Windows XP was being announced like it was like early, um, or beta releases were coming out in 2001. Like there wasn't even three years of effort before XP started to come out. <clears throat> ME came out in like 2000, and it was the most unstable thing ever. So. At the same time as Windows 2000, Windows Millennium Edition was being worked on, and they were taking the two trees of Windows, the two roots, the DOS root and the NT root, and trying to push them both up into the new, you know, the new millennium. So in 2001, what's going to win? Well, Windows Millennium Edition turned out to, it tried to bring more of the NT philosophy into Windows 98, and it ended up making it one of the most unstable systems to date. In fact, if you've ever used Millennium Edition, you know that a completely clean install of it, fresh install right out of the box, you can install ME and Explorer might crash on you just first boot. You might get an Explorer has crashed text box. I mean, it's ridiculous how bad Windows Millennium Edition really was. Um, I, I can't believe they put that product out because it was embarrassingly bad. So, Millennium Edition's trash, right? It's obvious to Microsoft at this point, you know what? We, we've tried. This isn't working. And most programs by, you know, 2000, 2001, most programs are 32-bit now anyway. The number of people running 16-bit software is getting slim, but the number of people running DOS software is even slimmer. <clears throat> so you've got over a decade of people transitioning to Windows, at least the 16-bit Windows API. And now they, um, I mean, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. It's just, it's such a fundamental paradigm shift. Like it took 10 years for people to move up to Win32 and you know get into the Windows 95 groove but once enough of it was there Microsoft flipped that damn switch and they said okay we're gonna take Windows 2000 we're gonna put a fresh coat of paint on it that's gonna piss Jody off for about five years and we're gonna make that the next consumer OS and bring NT stability to the consumer Windows market and that's exactly what they did <clears throat> and that's exactly why so many people who were around in the early 2000s doing computing stuff think Windows XP was the shit because it was because if you look at what Windows XP did Windows XP was the first version of Windows that was stable like that was actually stable to the vast majority of people Windows XP was where the stability began hang on this rig is just all up in my damn way and everybody else's for that matter why are you getting over, bro? You're just going to have to get back over. That's stupid. Um, anyway, look, I-40. Welcome to Greensboro. So I guess I don't have as much time as I thought. But the thing is, um, because a lot of you got your introduction 
um, to NT through Windows XP, which is technically NT 5.1, Vista being 6.0. Um, Windows 2000 was NT 5.0. It was the predecessor to XP. It's what XP was built on, but the thing is, Windows 2000 did not have that BS code of paint. It did not have fast user switching. It did not have the themed nonsense, the, you know, the, the fancy painted start menu and all that. It was still the nice, relatively flat, you know, the beveled edge, um, 3D controls, you know, Windows 95, 98 style of interface, the kind that is faster to render. Now, you still had gradients, like the 98 style title bar gradients. You still had that. But what you didn't have was the, the blue, like the green start menu on the blue bar and the wonky, like, rounded corner crap. And back in the day, I want to be very clear about this. Back in the day, the hardware of the time, first of all, a lot of these themes were not accelerated by a graphics card. Windows 10 made it mandatory to have hardware acceleration for the desktop window manager that does all the theme stuff so that it could use video card features for things like transparency and, and blurring. But in Windows 2000, all that was software rendered um, well, the transparency was. Um, and in Windows XP, that stuff still, you know, that, that nifty fresh coat of paint, software rendering. What did that mean? That meant your processor back then would use up a bunch of cycles drawing these fancy, you know, graphical, like basically just stretching bitmaps out all over the place to draw title bars and uh, rounded corners and all that stuff. And it, it was noticeable on machines of the era. You have to remember, a typical computer that someone might be running in the very early 2000s when Windows XP came out in 2002, it would not be remotely unusual for someone to install XP on a Pentium 2 or 3. Because Pentium 4s were the newest hot shit. They were not good shit, but they were hot. They were very hot. They ran very hot and didn't go very fast for the amount of heat. Um, a high-end Pentium 3 could outrun a mid-end Pentium 4 because they were just that bad. But I, I don't want to talk about that. I destroy. I destroy every socket 478 Pentium 4 that I get my hands on because they're that bad. They really have atrocious performance per watt to the point that no one should ever run them. But if you have a Pentium 2 and you're running Windows XP, this thing is not some kind of high-end, you know, these aren't 64-bit chips. We're talking about chips that are running in the 2 to 400 megahertz range. A lot of them would be Celerons, Pentium 2-based Celerons. Hell, a lot of people would be running Windows XP on a Pentium 1. You know, you could easily be running it on a Pentium 1, but if you were running it on a, a P2-level Celeron, you're talking about a chip with small caches and not a very fast computation speed. So when you're when you're talking about a 32-bit processor, that yes, it's super scalar without you know out of order execution and branch prediction and all that. So it's got all the Pentium Pro features. You know maybe it can use the MMX features of the Pentium 2 to do some faster operations. Maybe. But that doesn't really help with this drawing of this extra crap. The themes are actually a large reason that I don't like Windows XP compared to 2000, because it does introduce a big overhead. If I go in there and I manually switch to the Windows Classic theme, and I go and disable fast user switching and the themes service, XP's performance gets a lot closer to 2000. But it's still not on par with 2000. It's still a little lower than 2000. It's, it's still a little bit slower. 2000, it, it took a little while to boot. But oh my god, once you got Windows 2000 booted up, it was fast as hell. Like, you, you would just... It was amazing. It was quick and it was rock solid. And on the hardware of the era, it was quick for that hardware. We're talking hard drives that you couldn't, like the maximum read speed might be 15 or 20 megabytes a second tops if you have a good drive. We're not talking like today. Today, I have like 
14 terabyte hard drives that can read at 200 something megs a second at the beginning. If these machines were an order of magnitude slower and they had like 32 megs of RAM, 64 megs of RAM, ran at 300 megahertz instead of 3000, you know, had half the bit width, they could only work on half as much data at a time, the RAM was slower. You know, we're, we're talking not even DDR memory at this point. You don't even have like DDR200 memory. You're still in the PC100 versus PC133 era. You're still talking RAM that runs at 100 megahertz. And I want to be very clear here. At that low of a level, you're talking 32 bits at 100 megahertz, right? 100 million clocks per second. <clears throat> Just a naive calculation, okay? You can, it, let's assume, this is not valid, but let's assume that every single clock you could read something from RAM. That's still about, um, what, 100 megahertz, 400? You're talking a memory bandwidth max, like maybe 400 megabytes a second. Um, but in machines with 64 megabytes, I mean, we're talking... The RAM takes a human perceptible amount of time for the whole thing to even just be like zeroed. That's how slow things were. In the XP era, even with your graphics drivers loaded so you'd have 2D acceleration, it was not unusual for these themes and such. You could, on some slow machines, watch things wipe. Like you could watch them. If the, if the virtual memory pressure was really high and it was thrashing, you'd just watch that screen like err, 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 because it would be stopping to page stuff in and out of the hard drive. It was so slow. But the reason that Windows 2000 is better than XP is it didn't have this extra coat of paint crap. It, it did not have a bunch of this frou-frou bloat that was, frankly, I think was just there to make it look pretty for normies that don't know any better. Um, it is Windows XP without the bloat. It, it's almost like running a Windows Server operating system. And in fact, that's what I did. I ran Windows 2000 Advanced Server. Obviously, I pirated it. But I wanted to see what the big deal was with it. it it's really not any different. But Windows 2000 is XP without the bloat. And that's the bottom line. All this babble, that, that's what it ultimately comes down to. It was, a, it was a clean user interface because it didn't have the themes. It didn't have the inherent bloat that comes with the themes. Why is somebody going to do this while I'm trying to... Yeah, that doesn't need to happen. Um, and while there are some niceties in XP that are not present in 2000, the bottom line is that the lack of the extra crap, the lack of all the fruity icons and extra sounds and the theme engine that makes everything slow, and there's just a bunch of stuff that's not there, it meant that if you put Windows 2000 on the same hardware as Windows XP, it would run faster, it would look cleaner, it didn't have all that extra shit, it would draw things faster, it was just generally a more efficient system because it didn't have the pile of extra crap. I suppose I took way too long to say all that. Yeah, I mean, the truth of the matter is though, Windows 2000 it's not that different from Windows XP. Once you set aside the theme engine and fast user switching, the differences are mostly just incremental kernel level things. There's some, you know, obviously there's some extra drivers in there, um, built in support for like USB 2.0, which was a new thing back then. Um, Actually, now that I think about it, I don't know if Windows XP with no service pack supports USB 2. Because I don't even know if it had come out yet. Um, I'd have to go back. It's been so long, I don't remember. But at some point, if they didn't already have it, they added USB 2.0 support, which was a, a... USB 2 was a game changer because before USB 2, flash media was really slow. And if even if you made like an external flash drive or hard drive or whatever, um, it was it was pretty bad. Because um, USB 1.1 maxes out at 12 megabits per second, which is, you can roughly divide by 8 or 10 or whatever to get an estimate. 
<clears throat> but yeah, you're talking like 1.2 to 1.5 megabytes per second, which is faster than a floppy, um, but it's nothing compared to what a hard drive can do. USB 2 kind of modernized the USB interface, and Windows XP came with support, if not immediately, in the first service pack for native USB 2.0. Hang on just a second. See if I can avoid getting hit. But just because it came with support for USB 2 and mass storage, whatever, that doesn't mean that it was better. That just means that it came with those drivers built in. And that doesn't really make it an improvement. Um, there weren't really any significant improvements in XP over 2000. And I know it's a bit anticlimactic to be like, basically 2000's better because 2000 came first and wasn't made for consumers. I know that's that's really just kind of... What are you doing, dude? God, just go! Fuck. Fucking retard. I slow down and he slows down and then he flicks his lights at me. God, I hate people so fucking much. <sighs> just fucking go past me, you fucking moron. Anyway, road rage over. Bottom line, bottom line, Windows 2000 was Windows XP without the bloat. That's why it was better. I like the Windows 2000 interface better. I know some people think that the Windows XP themes, oh, they looked better? Well, that's all subjective because here's the problem. It might look nicer in terms of just being this more rounded, you know, colorful sort of deal, <clears throat> but it came at the expense of worse performance, both graphically and just all around. Just It was a more bloated system. It, it became more visually cluttered. There's crap like in the control panel where it tries to present you a bunch of friendly categories that don't really help you, um, that you don't really need, that the first thing I would do is switch the view to the classic, just show me all the fucking icons, don't give me friendly categories view. You know, there's all that unnecessary stuff, and, and that's it. It's XP without the unnecessary crap, and it's faster. I don't, what more do I need? Like, <laughs> and yeah, in the modern age, I have no doubt that somebody would make Windows 2000 if they took it and they modernized it. <clears throat> I have no doubt that there would be a theme engine that takes advantage of the more modern graphical accelerations to make the flat windows look a little bit more pretty, you know. But I guess part of my problem is, what are you doing, dude? What are you doing? Part of my problem is, why do you need it? Why do you need any of that garbage? You know, and, and this is where we come to a fundamental disconnect. I'm almost at sheets to get some chow, so, and some fuel. But this is where we come to a fundamental disconnect between the way that people like me who actually get real work done think and other people who don't get real work done think. See, I refer to them as normies, but there are people who are, there are people who are user interface or, or user experience designers like the Linux experiment on YouTube who have spent years doing work in the computer field and yet they're still so wrong when it comes to stuff, pretty fundamental stuff, about user interfaces. Part of the reason Windows 2000's interface was the best in Windows ever is because it got everything done that you needed to do as quickly as possible without a bunch of superfluous effects that made it feel slower, that made your actions, that made the response to your actions slower unnecessarily just for frou-frou, woo-hoo, look at how cushy it is. It got all that shit done as fast as possible with as little fluff as possible. It got out of your way. When you use the start menu, you don't have to do a whole bunch of extra clicks to find stuff. It's cascaded in a logical manner, in alphabetical order, at least you can make it that way. So things were predictable and it's just stayed out of your way. The best thing that an operating system can do is stay out of your way. When you interact with it, you, you interact with it as minimally as possible and it gets done what you want done as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, and just stays out of your way. Because at the end of the day, when I'm looking at my 
whatever it is. Let's let's just say, uh, let's just say it's like LibreOffice or WordPad or something. You know, whatever. Any any word processor. Am I using the colored gradient? Yeah, transparent glass, rounded corner window decorations? Or am I using the part in the middle where it's actually just the fucking word processor? <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of obvious when I say it that way, isn't it? It's pretty fucking obvious. I'm using the word processor part of the word processor. I'm using the browser part of the browser. I'm not using the title bar. I'm not using the window borders. I'm not using any of that. But what I am using is the scroll bar. I'm using the hyperlinks inside. I'm using the toolbar. And this is my argument against things like the Office 2007 and Up ribbon with all of its crap. Like, it, it should just be the tools that you need in a linear layout, in a consistent layout, so that you can find what you need quickly. What you need doesn't go anywhere different. What you need always looks the same, and there's not extra crap that makes it harder for you to find stuff because it's visual noise. I mean, frankly, to some extent, to, and, and I'm not giving them any actual credit here, but to some extent, Windows 8, with its stupid flat interface, the icons and the just lack of borders and all that stuff is stupid. Just the monochrome, barely perceptible what it's supposed to be thing, that's all stupid. But at least, at least with a flat interface, one of the things you cannot fault it for is adding unnecessary stupid visual noise. The problem is that in in their rush to not add stupid, unnecessary visual noise, they kind of end up also not adding things like indications that something's actually clickable, or boundaries between clickable elements. Uh, you know, stuff like that that's kind of fucking important for a user interface. Windows 2000 took the concepts that they were trying to do in Windows 8 with the flat interface, it actually had them. It actually had all of them and it had them nailed. The gradients were not exaggerated wackadoodle crazy shit because they couldn't be. Because they still had to support VGA 16 color displays. So even the high color icons, they had to be renderable down to 16 color fallbacks. They, they could not support these really crazy gradients because the problem is when they would render down they'd look like utter, utter garbage. They'd be really hard to look at. They needed something that was consistent across a wide variety of displays and in Windows 2000 they nailed it, man. They absolutely nailed it. It wasn't excessive. Windows XP is where the whole gradient, you know, bulgy 3D, you know, things look like they're not just flat on the screen things started to get a little bit excessive and you know, it arguably just got worse and more ridiculous um, until at least in Windows 7 they kind of made it so that you could accept it. But it was still ridiculous. Oh, everybody and their goddamn brother is here today, apparently. So that's, uh, that, that, that's great. I don't know how I'm going to get any fucking gas with this going on, but whatever. Okie dokie. Or I'm just going to pull up somewhere. Anywho... Uh, whoever that is is calling. I'm going to stick a shoe up their ass. So, yeah, Windows 2000, it, it kind of managed to accomplish everything that Windows XP or 7 or 8 or 10, all the user interface goals were accomplished. And it kind of only got worse from there. XP was this gaudy, excessively saturated... I mean, I like saturation, don't get me wrong, but they went way overboard with the gradients and stuff. The themes were unnecessary fluff that slowed the system down. Um, in Vista, they added the whole frosted glass arrow thing. They carried it up into 7. And, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't care for it. I would rather have the Windows 2000 interface any day of the week. On Windows 7 and older, I would set the interface to Windows Classic. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that some programs, it turns out, actually start having problems because they assume you're always running the Arrow engine now. So, 
Then in 8, they had the flat paradigm. They had the full screen start menu that completely just took you out of everything. It, it was just a disaster. And 8.1, they tried to fix it. They didn't. They just made it a little better. Marginally, not really. And then in 10, you know, they fixed a bunch of the dumb from Windows 8, but we've never gone back to Windows 2000. The simple, elegant, works everywhere, interface that stays out of your way, easy to do what you need to do, responsive, quick. We've never gone back there with Windows, and it's a damn shame. Well, it looks like I'm going to get some, uh, some of that 88-octane, 15% ethanol crap in my car for cheap and see if it catches on fire. So thanks for listening, and have a wonderful day. Take care.